Okay, so we are recording. Before we start, I'd like to go over some ground rules for tonight's meeting. I haven't participated in multiple meetings of this kind. I know that this can be a sensitive topic. Um, I want to make it clear that no decisions are being made tonight, and at no time will it be acceptable to be disrespectful to anyone during this meeting. Everyone's entitled to their own opinion. There's no right or wrong opinion. We are here tonight to try to collect as many comments and questions about this proposal as possible. We are not here to facilitate personal debates or make any decisions on the proposal. With all that said, tonight is not a debate on the legalization of marijuana. That debate occurred at the ballot box during the state election in 2016, and we are here today because it was overwhelmingly supported in the city, including in the neighborhood of Charlestown. There will be a time at the end of the applicant's presentation for questions and comments. I'd ask that all questions be directed toward the applicant and myself. The applicant will answer all, all questions related to their proposal to the best of their ability. And I will answer all questions specific to the city's process to the best of my ability. If we are unable to answer a question you might have, we'll follow up after the meeting to get that information to you. We're currently within an open comment period, meaning that if you do not get called on tonight, or if you think of questions that have not been answered, all you need to do is reach out to us and we will work with you to get you that information. This comment period will continue until the public hearings are held at the zoning board and the cannabis board. Again, before we begin, I'd like to take a second to familiarize everyone with WebEx if you haven't been here already. Um, during the question and comments portion, attendees will be asked to raise their hand if they would like to speak. If you are logged on online or with the WebEx platform, you can open the participation tab. It looks like a person with three lines through them. And click on the hand icon at the bottom left corner. Click it again once you have finished with your question or comment to lower your hand. If you are calling on the phone, all you have to do is dial star three to raise your hand and then dial star three again to lower your hand after your question or comment. So once the presentation has concluded, I will again reiterate some of the ground rules and we will open the floor for questions and comments. Um, I also wanna take a quick moment to recognize any elected officials or reporters who may be in attendance at tonight's meeting. Uh, feel free to raise your hand now if you are here for either of those reasons um, and introduce yourself. I do want to say um, the Councilor Edwards office did reach out to me. Um, they will be attending later tonight. Um, they have a personal thing going on, but uh, Ricardo Patron from the Councilor's office will be on this evening um, as, as he got in touch with me. Uh, do we have any other elected officials or or reporters? I don't see any hands raised, but feel free to introduce yourself during the question and comment period as well. Uh, so again, thank you all for attending, for attending tonight. Um, thanks for taking the time out of your schedules for tonight's meeting. I'm now gonna hand it over to the applicants for the presentation. Uh, if one of you would like to share your screen for the presentation, feel free to do so now. Uh, you guys can unmute yourselves too whenever you're ready. You can get started. We're unmuted. Thank you, guys. <laughs> we're ready? Yeah, we're ready. Yeah, whenever you're ready, go ahead. Awesome. Here we go. All right. Good evening, everybody, and thank you very much for coming on to join us tonight. I am Maggie Supri. I'm co-founder and owner of the Heritage Club, and this is my partner, Nikki John. 
Uh, before we get started, there, we'd like to thank you, Quinlan, for organizing tonight's event and for emceeing tonight. Uh, family and friends, thank you for um, your support and for joining us tonight, and of course, to the community. Um, thank you for being here as well. All right. That's good. Okay, so who we are. We are the Heritage Club. We are a female minority LGBTQ owned business started by two high school friends, Maggie Supri and Nikki John, both born and raised in Boston. Our mission is to create a recognizable and trusted brand built by providing a diverse and quality product offering. Heritage aims to create a streamlined retail experience in person and online. Ultimately, we hope to leverage the work we do and use it to enhance the surrounding community. So our core value and mission statement is where we're from is where we give back. We think it's really important to focus on diversity, inclusion, accountability, education, creating opportunities for others. And this is a key responsibility of any cannabis entrepreneur. So to introduce ourselves further and tell you about our background, I'm Nikki John. I am from Dorchester, Massachusetts, Boston born and raised, and I'm a social equity and BCB applicant here in Boston. I graduated from Northeastern University in 2015, where I studied finance and minored in psychology. And right now I run my own real estate brokerage, Vibe Residential, which I've run for five years and I've been in real estate for eight years. In addition to that, I've been the founding president of BNI Legacy Charlestown, which meets Wednesdays at the Knights of Columbus. And we focus on networking with local business owners to help them build their business, entrepreneurs and existing businesses. Um, so come on out to that if you're trying to build your business out during COVID. And right now I'm on the membership committee for that. And then Maggie, you wanna tell us? So my name is Maggie Supri. I am the proud daughter of Mary and Billy Supri, formerly of 29 Brighton Street. As many of you know, my dad grew up in Charlestown and I still have a lot of family there. I didn't grow up in Charlestown, but all of my siblings were born in the Lost Village. So this neighborhood is particularly important to me as this is where the story of my family began. I grew up in Southie, and just like a lot of kids from Boston, hockey played a very big part in my life. It opened a lot of doors for me. I went to Fair Academy, I went to Noble and Greeno School, and then I went on to Brown University where I played hockey and lacrosse and got my degree in entrepreneurship. In 2012, I started at Suffolk University Law School, and it was during that time that my interest in this industry really sparked. Um, I helped spearhead a student advocacy group known as the Massachusetts Citizens for Responsible Regulation. And this was back before question four had been voted on to legalize recreational adult use. So we were working back then to educate residents and um, promote the financial and social benefits of a regulated industry. After graduating from Suffolk, I started working in real estate law. And about two and a half years ago, I started consulting for a cannabis law firm in Western Mass, helping fellow entrepreneurs through the licensing process. Um, it was in that time that Nikki and I teamed up and we began to build what is now known as the Heritage Club. Um, as we go through our operations and um, present to you our plan, um, we're gonna highlight our parking options, our delivery plan, um, our track record of professional success and what we represent as women in this industry. And we hope to make it very clear that we believe our location is best equipped to serve the community. Um, I understand the loyalty and the pride that the people from this neighborhood have because my dad, my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, they all embody it. Um, I have a, a lot of respect for, for my family name um, and that's what will hold me accountable and that is what will inspire me to bring good business and good opportunity to this town and more specifically the Lost Village. To talk about our cannabis related experience and business related experience. Together, we have over 20 years of business experience, 10 years of customer service experience, five years of management, and two years of um, sales and also cannabis um, related experience. So, to go into that a little deeper, I was part of the CCC's social equity program. I was part of the first cohort that graduated this past April. I was also part of Lantern's Delivery Accelerator. Lantern is Jizzly's cannabis business, um, and that is a license type that's going to be coming up in Boston, which we'll talk about more later. Um, I finished that this summer. I'm also a founding mem member of MassCAD, which is Massachusetts Associ Cannabis Association for Delivery, where we advocate for the delivery license type that's going to be coming out and for more equity in cannabis. Um, and I bring my management experience from Vibe Residential and previous retail experience at Apple, which 
they only hire one percent of applicants so it's a really exciting opportunity to know that they choose the best and that's what we want to do when we're hiring it's also a secured retail environment so you walk in and all of these computers which are very expensive are stored in the back we have a similar customer service um, outlook that we'd like to have at heritage and same operational protocol which we'll bring over and as i mentioned um, I've been working for the last two and a half years as a cannabis law consultant in Western Mass. Um, I've worked with manufacturers, retail shop owners, testing labs, cultivators, um, you name it. I've, I've helped work in um, through the licensing process with, which, with that type of establishment. Um, I've seen success. I've seen failure. Um, and from my experience, what I've, I've learned what works and what common pitfalls to avoid. Um, I have a very solid understanding of the rules and the regulations that are governing this industry, which I think will be an added benefit to the security and the operational success of the Heritage Club. So, I'll talk a little bit about our advisors and strategic partners. Um, we want to thank all of them and we'll introduce them with their bios. But before that, we want to let you guys know that our advisors do not have any financial or voting interest in our company. We know there's a lot of questions and right now Maggie and I own 100% of our business. Um, but to start, we have Dr. Robin Reed. Dr. Reed is the CEO and co-founder of the Wellness Collaborative. It's a community health center that will be opening in Nubian Square next year. Dr. Reed is an internist with 25 years of medical experience, having served as chief of, the Medi of medicine at Shattuck Hospital and medical director at the Old Colony Correctional Center in Boston pre-release. She has over 30 years of teaching experience and was the director of Northeastern's Physician Physicians Assistant Program. Um, she graduated from Stanford for undergrad, got her medical degree at NYU, her MBA at Northeastern, and is currently an MPH candidate at Harvard School of Public Health. We have Niall McManus, the president and co-owner of Valiant America. As president, he has been the foreperson for all of Valiant's offerings, and they've been specializing in cannabis for all of those years, which is very rare to find someone with that much experience. So we have someone on our team to help us with the build-out as well as operations and consulting, and he's been a huge help in our process thus far. Our third advisor is attorney Lori Lucian. Um, Lori is a Boston attorney with experience in health and life sciences, especially pharmaceuticals. She's moved into the cannabis space where she has worked with California operators and is working on her own grow here, Major Bloom in Massachusetts. She's really passionate about giving back and understands our mission, which is why we were so excited to work with her. And most importantly, she's a cannabis professor at Suffolk University. There aren't many universities that teach cannabis. So she's a leader in the space, graduating from Suffolk and have got her undergrad at UMass. To continue on, we have Matt um, McAlvin Romain. From head of, he's had a product at Lantern, which I mentioned is the accelerator we were part of, and he's agreed to help advise us during this process. We're gonna be opening a delivery license as soon as we can and we want to build a good brand. So he brings over seven years of experience after graduating with an MBA from New Michigan and a bachelor's from BC, and is also a Boston resident and member or student at Boston Latin School. Our final advisor, Scott Newman, is the business development rep at Adaptive HR, and he's been a key networking source for us, helping us find some of the people who led us to this location, which is really exciting since both being in real estate, real estate was still really hard to find during this process. Um, Adaptive HR offers a PEO, and this is going to help us offer great um, employee benefits and also just HR in general, keeping us compliant. To follow it up, we're going to talk about our potential business partners. Um, on the left side, you'll see the company names, a few of them, and on the right, a few that we'll partner with for banking. Um, cannabis banking is difficult, but there's a few in Massachusetts and also People's Credit Union. We're going to work with Lantern when we're building out our delivery business, Gilbert Insurance, to make sure that we're insured. Coast Cannabis is a woman-owned business out of Wareham. Um, they go by T-Bear, but the Coast Cannabis is just one of their brands. And we are also working with Vicente Cedarburg, another industry leader both here and in Colorado for legal um, to help us navigate the application process. So to continue on talking about applications, I know there's a lot of text and I don't expect you guys to read it, but these are a lot of acronyms that we'll explain. So there's the CCC. The Cannabis Control Commission, SEP, the Social Equity Program, the BCB, the Boston Cannabis Board, and I'm going to explain what each of those are, and the stuff in bold is what I'm going to highlight. So the CCC is the state level. They created all of the regulations that we're going to have to follow. The Social Equity Program is a program run by the CCC to help bring equity to cannabis, and the BCB is Boston's Cannabis Board. And it's really, if you have a second to go to each of these websites and learn more, it would be great, but we don't expect you to. So here are the highlights. The CCC was looking to create an industry that will be characterized by participation by small and large participants and with full and robust participation by minorities, women, and veterans. The social equity program focuses on those most impacted by the war on drugs, marijuana prohibition, disproportionate arrest, and incarceration. The BCB 
created this ordinance to ensure Boston is a model for how to create a system that fosters racial equity and inclusion in the new cannabis industry. And for those reasons, we think that these programs were meant to empower candidates exactly like us and that we're the right fit. So Max, I'm going to tell you guys about what we're applying for. Yes, yeah, so we will be applying for both our retail and our delivery license. Uh, the new regulations that are governing delivery were supposed to be voted on today, actually, but that has been delayed. Um, we've always intended to operate a delivery service alongside our retail business, and uh, despite the delay in regulations being published, um, we're still going to address this and touch upon it a little bit later in our presentation. Now, this slide here is our projected timeline, and this represents just a snapshot of what we've been working on in total as the idea for the Heritage Club was born prior to Nikki joining the social equity program. Um, though, as you can see, uh, Nikki completed the social equity program in the spring of 2020. We submitted our application to Boston in August. We submitted our plans and application for a conditional use permit to uh, inspectional services in September. We spent August through October engaging in community outreach and talking with the neighbors. Uh, the orange tab there marks tonight's milestone event, the community outreach meeting. Um, from here, we hope to be invited before the BCB on November 12th. Um, also hoping to go before the ZBA for a conditional use permit at some point in November. In December, we hope that we'll have everything in place and we can submit our final application to the CCC, which again is the state board. Um, we hope to start construction at some point in January. Uh, we're hoping to get our provisional license in March, our final license in April, and ideally our doors would open for business mid to late April of 2021. Awesome. So why Heritage and why ask for this? I know I've listed five reasons, but we really think there are more than five reasons why we're the right fit. And we want to thank you guys. We have over 200 letters of support and we'd appreciate any more if you haven't sent one in. Um, but to start, A, diversity and inclusion. We think that we are a good fit because we're part of the social equity program, which gives us an accelerated or um, expedited review process with the state. With the BCB, we beat the equity ordinance there, and Boston is doing a one-to-one -one ratio of equity and general applicants. So that means that we're one of our types of businesses would have to go before a general applicant. Um, and in addition to just the state and local level of diversity, we want to bring that home and do that with who we hire. Um, that's a huge part of our company credo and something we intend to, to follow through on. Secondly, we're Boston owned and operated. We're from the 617 and for the 617. And that's super important to us that it's local and not out of state operators that are coming in. We're community focused, which means that instead of being out of state, we're right here so you can talk to us. We're going to be there on site. So a lot of people think we have to be from Charles Sound to be able to do this. And we're going to be on site 24 7. So you could always talk to us and any way that you need to. We take pride in where we're from and we want to show that we want to give back. Um, a lot of people are here just for the green rush. And so we'll move to D people driven. We think the people that we're working with and that we're serving are the most important. And that means that we're going to e provide education. That's going to be education for our staff so they can move up in this um, in the ranks and through managerial programs, but also for our customers, both online and in store. And when they leave, um, they'll leave with the information they need to safely use cannabis, which we think is really important. So this slide here shows the aerial view of our proposed location at 116 Cambridge Street. This location was chosen because it meets all of the requirements in regards to zoning, security, and parking. It's a 3,000 square foot building, and we will be renovating it and um, with the design to produce sort of a, an open retail layout that will allow for social distancing, for crowd control, and for efficient customer flow. And as you can see on the slide, the key features of this location is that it's very walkable, uh, it offers parking and it's a standalone building, which offers added security measures. Um, but again, we'll circle back to the security aspect of the, of the layout a little bit later in the presentation. Uh, this image here shows the current building. Um, we'll obviously be renovating this place inside and out. We'll be adding exterior lighting and surveillance for 360 coverage. Um, but again, the security measures will be addressed uh, a little bit later. So, on this next slide, I want to bring your attention to the photo on the right. And I want to point out and clarify that our store will be located in the building behind the one that you see there on the street. Um, an advantage of our store's location is that it will be totally unseen from the street. So any customers coming or going from our location will not be visible to the residents of the neighborhood. Um, this building here, the front building, is included in our lease, so we will be renovating this structure. 
bringing it up to code, making it look jazzy so it's not, you know, such an eyesore there on Cambridge Street. Um, and we anticipate that we'll be using this location for office space and to conduct employee trainings. This one here shows um, a rough idea of what we anticipate the exterior of the building to look like. It'll be a very clean, very modern, an inconspicuous design. Again, the exterior will be equipped with commercial grade surveillance cameras, proper lighting to allow for adequate surveillance, and our signage will be in, co in compliance with the state and the local um, regulations. And there will be absolutely no mention or no marketing of marijuana or marijuana products anywhere outside of our building. So to talk about the zoning, our building is commercially zoned, specifically it's local convenience and local industrial, which we think is important. We're not in a residential zone, but we do wanna be respectful of our neighbors. So we're excited that we get to talk to you guys today about what we're gonna be doing. Um, the buffer requirements mandated by the state are that we're 1,000 feet minimum from the nearest school and 500 feet from the nearest church. And this area in particular is great because we're not anywhere near any of those buffers, not even close. Um, there's a half a mile buffer from another cannabis establish establishment in Boston. And right now in Boston, there are none that are within a half mile from where we are. So location, 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 we have a great one. Um, to talk about traffic, we have Maggie. <laughs> Over to you. <laughs> Weekend update. Um, so we specifically want to give a shout out to Karen Burns and Laura Caltenko, who addressed parking in last week's meeting. And we want to make sure that you guys are heard. And we think that we have a plan in place that will mitigate your concerns. A huge advantage that our location offers is parking. Our location offers 11 parking spots, seven for retail customers, one of which will be designated for ADA compliance. Um, in addition to that, we will have two spots for delivery, drop off and pickup. We will have two spots for curbside pickup while that is still authorized. And on weeknights after five and on weekends, we will have access to an additional 12 adjacent parking spots for customers to use, which means that we will increase our parking access to 23 spots during those times. Um, we are also in negotiations with a nearby landowner for a potential um, additional 40 spots that we would use as employee offsite parking. Um, our location is obviously highly accessible as it's situated within walking distance of Sullivan Square and Union Square. Sullivan Square offers uh, subway access and bus transit. Union Square offers bus transit and will have T access at some point during 2021. The closest bus stop to our location um, is about 500 feet away from our front door and that offers service to the number 86 and the number 91 buses. Um, T ridership is all uh, obviously down 90%, which realistically means that people will be accessing us by car. Um, though, based on our projections, we believe that our operational parking plan will be able to sustain the volume of customers we have coming through. Additionally, Cambridge Street offers a designated bike lane, so our location will provide a bike rack for cyclists to secure their equipment while they are inside of our location. Um, and we're going to encourage customers to utilize this method of transit to minimize traffic congestion and to minimize the impact on the environment. Um, parking features. As I mentioned, the biggest benefit of our location is that we offer parking. Um, if you have visited other urban dispensaries, the lack of parking can be challenging and it can be a deterrence. Um, an inner city, an inner city dispensary with ample parking like ours will allow for an easier and safer customer experience. The green spots are the 11 dedicated spots I mentioned earlier, um, and those will be available during all of our operational hours. And the orange spots are the 12 overflow spots that will be available in the evenings and on weekends. Talk about traffic, we have a routing plan for vehicles and we'd like to request, request that our address be changed to Roland Street. If any of you guys know Cambridge Street, it's very congested, especially during rush hour. So by moving our address so where people will get dropped off or be Google Mapsing to arrive, by putting that on Roland Street, um, it's the back one, kind of where that yellow car is. That way Uber drivers will have that designated drop off, drop off spot and people coming to park will come around as opposed to getting pull, pulling up right on Cambridge Street and trying to access us that way. And that front building, like we mentioned, is for office space. So there's nothing for them to do there. They need to come around to the back. So they'll come onto Carter, take that right, come around Roland and on Stark Street, they can access our parking lot. Or if they're an Uber driver, they can stop right there on Roland and be let out. The best thing about this is that there's an existing traffic light right there at the corner of Stark and Cambridge. And we'll be able to use that to direct traffic as they rejoin the Cambridge traffic that already is there on the street. So 
next, we'll talk about our floor plan. We have over 1500 square feet of customer um, retail space and 3000 square feet total in that building. Um, this gives us ample waiting room for so we can minimize queues and we have limited access areas in the back for authorized employees and personnel with Jesse, our security personnel we'll talk about after. And we have a back to house area that stores cannabis that is not visible to the public, which is part of the state mandate. So to talk a little bit more about our floor plan, we have um, a great open layout with 15 kiosks. This is not something you see in a lot of city um, dispensaries. It's really important that every architect we mentioned, you need 2,500 square feet minimum to have a good site. And we have 3,000, so we definitely meet that. Um, it's ADA accessible, so people can come in, whether they're in wheelchairs, crutches, walking, whatever it is, it's easily accessible for them. We're expecting 500 customers a day. And with 15 kiosks, that's about 20 minutes per customer, which is a lot more than people are actually spending, but we want to give them that time so we can do the education that we're promising them. We also have that consulting room down there in the bottom. That's something that we think is important. We visited a lot of dispensaries and found that you're kind of standing right next to people. And if you want to talk to someone about what it is that you want to use it for, we're not medical, so we can't advise them, but giving them a space to talk is what's important to us. And that's why we have that. Um, in terms of meeting COVID requirements, we have enough space that even at capacity with that 500 projection, we'll still be able to do the six foot spacing. And we don't know when the new normal will return. We'll talk about that more on the next slide. Um, for customer flow, you'll come in, you'll check in there, and you can also use the self checkout kiosk in case you didn't get a chance to pre-order or couldn't do it on your phone, you'll be able to do it right there and then come and pick up once you come through. Inside, there's gonna be five kiosks dedicated for pickup. One of those will be dedicated specifically for delivery. So once delivery is an option, our drivers will be able to come in easily, pick up and leave. Um, we'll also have all the other 10 for people who wanna have a conversation with our staff. And they'll queue up in between those display cases there and use that as a kind of barrier for the line. Um, so in order to get these permits um, to come to fruition, we're gonna work with local officials, local permitting boards to make sure that we have something that's safe and up to standard. Just about our day-to-day -day operations and our hours, we're gonna be operating from 8 to 9 p.m. Most dispensaries open at 10:30, 11, and we chose 8 to 10:30 to be for delivery only. So no walking or driving customers or pickup customers will be coming to our, our site from 8 to 10:30. That's specifically so our delivery drivers are able to come and get the product that they're gonna be delivering. And we think this will decrease the amount of traffic that will be coming into the actual store. Um, from the hours of 10.30 to 9 p.m., Monday through Friday, those will be general operating hours. And on Saturday and Sunday, it will be 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. So during our initial opening, like I mentioned, we'll have the, not luxury, but we'll be able to have a slow rollout. Right now, things are, are down. A lot of dispensaries that plan to have 600 people right now are only having 300 people come through. So we don't plan to be at full capacity off the bat, and we think that slow rollout will allow us to create really good standards and operating procedures that we'll be able to carry out once we do reach full capacity. Three, we have pre-order, so customers can order online. This is another opportunity for education. On our website, they'll be able to learn about the products, and if they want to, they can talk to us about them in store or go straight to the pickup kiosks that I pointed out on the floor plans. Um, delivery is another option for us to decrease traffic. Um, it's a great way to save people time. If you've seen the lines at NETA, we're not looking to have anything like that, and we have enough space in store to, to mitigate that altogether. So next up, Matt, we'll introduce Jesse. Yeah, so at this point, we are going to hand the mic over to our cons uh, security consultant, um, Jesse Jacobon. He is going to walk you through our security systems uh, that we have in place to ensure the safety of our customers, our staff, our building, our products, and the community. So please. Take it away, Jesse. Thank you, girls. Uh, so Thank you. my name is Jesse Jackson, and I am owner of KM Security Solutions. We have done over 15 dispensaries slash cultivations in Massachusetts. Uh, so we're just going to go through these slides, and we'll take you through key uh, systems are needed to uh, make this area safe. Can I actually move the slides, uh, Nikki? Okay. Oh, no, sorry. Did this work for you? <clears throat> yep. Perfect. Okay, so this is the layout of the facility, obviously, as you saw in the prior uh, slides. So we have 26 area and exterior outside of the building. So this will give the whole protection, the employees, 
of the the people who live in the around the facility. Um, also brings in access control, so we'll have key fob access, um, designated who comes in, who comes out of the building, and it's, everything is time stamped. Um, so this will be in cooperation with the security personnel that is on site. Um, they will have a check-in vestibule coming in through the main entrance. Um, you'll have to be buzzed in, sit in the vestibule, check in, and then go into into the facility. Um, this will also have a 24-7 alarm monitoring. Um, it's a dual redundant system, which means you'll have not one keypad, two keypads um, that have two monitoring contracts that is directly going to the police station. So this will uh, be also equipped with panic buttons underneath each of the POS systems, uh, along with uh, panic buttons throughout the building and strategic areas that need to be placed as well. Um, so we can go to the next slide too, Nikki. Okay. So the security plan um, that is in place um, is the 24-7 and exterior surveillance camera systems that I just spoke about, interior cameras and all uh, containing marijuana products or sales uh, that will be surveillance by cameras and also uh, access control key fob systems. All the key fob systems are designated to each employee. Uh, so everything is time stamped who's coming in, who's leaving. Um, also the secure data storage, which everything is routed back to. So all of the camera systems, all of the security of the surveillance, uh, intrusion detection will be routed back to the secure data storage, uh, which is also is surveillance by a camera and also panic buttons, as well as access control. So we have a interior and exterior lighting for the visibility. So the cameras itself are equipped with IR readers. IR readers gives you the ability to view at nighttime. Um, on top of that, we're doing an actual lighting uh, on the exterior of the building to give you no actual blind spots throughout the building and around the area. Um, the local police and fire access. Um, so the local police and fire will have access to the building on a knox box so if any of this uh system for the security for the intrusion detection will lo it will dispatch to the police center right away the police will respond and notify the proper people on the call list of what's going on um, so they'll be also able to dial in to the security system so god forbid if there's an incident occurring in the facility the police will be have the ability to actually dial into the, the camera systems and obtain on what's happening inside the facility. Um, this the security systems covering the perimeter entry and exit exits, featuring like I stated before, multiple panic buttons to notify local law enforcement in the event of a threat. The failure system is just a dual redundant system. So if one fails, is a backup that's also monitored going to the police station. The backup power generator. So if power does go out, the intrusion detection system, along with the access control and the security surveillance system, has its own battery backup. On top of that battery backup, we also have a generator um, that will kick on if power is lost. So in essence, the, the building will never have uh, loss of power. When it does, if it's in the middle of the night, the manager slash owner of the maintenance personnel will be notified that the power loss has occurred and they'll they'll dispatch uh, whoever's necessary to, in charge of the maintenance. Uh, so we have the limited access areas, uh, which is just for company agents, approved login visitors will be allowed access. So anytime even anyone comes into the building, there will be SOPs in place guidelines that they will check in areas and will be given visitors pass along with having a access control key fob. Um, at the end of the day, or at the time that they visit, the key fob will go back to the security personnel and the uh, access will be declined so they will not be able to enter the building again. Uh, the badge and ID systems, again, with the key fob system we just went over. Uh, so also the product. So written product management policy, um, secure vault for storage and cash and, and marijuana products. So the vault itself will have uh, usually two cameras in there, as well as a mesh 
screen that's uh, between each of the walls. So it'll be a mesh screen, security cameras, panic button, along with access control on that door lock. The only personnel that are, are um, able to enter into that vault is designated between one to three people and it's timestamped. So anyone goes in that vault, it's timestamped. It's usually uh, occurred through uh, another security personnel going with them into the vault. Uh, direct footage of any area that contains marijuana products, uh, licensed transport service for transport of products, regular inventory reconciliation daily, weekly, monthly, and annually. Uh, the cash debit card payments accepted to minimize the use of cash, written cash management policy, a secure vault for the cash, uh, the cash to be stored in a safe and secure vault separate from the sales floor. Direct footage of any area that contains cash, such as registers, sorting of storage and areas. Licensed transport service by transport of cash. They have an SOP that will be put in place as well. So anytime that there will be a pickup for cash or transport of cash between facilities, they'll have an SOP in place that whoever is picking up the, the, uh, the cash will call in 15 minutes prior. And then when they receive, when they um, enter the building or are outside of the building, they will again call with their ID and badge number to verify it is them. Um, so we can go to the next slide. Okay, so the delivery, uh, which I just went over. Um, so deliveries will be wait and recorded immediately. Separate entrance for product deliveries to the facility. So they won't be coming in the main entrance. There'll be a separate door that is directly for the deliveries. Again, they will be calling in. Um, they'll be given a, a visitor's pass. They'll be accompanied by a security personnel at all times with the cash uh, transfer. Deliveries areas will have designated cameras with proper coverage, GPS tracking of the deliveries, licensed transport provider. Uh, security personnel is going to have a minimum of two security personnel on site. This is the actual man personnel. Ensure the safety of all employees and customers. Monitor all security cameras during operational hours. Uh, thorough hiring and training process for all employees to include security uh, procedural trainings. Screen any individuals entering the facility and confirming they have valid ID. Prevent loitering outside the facilities. So the security personnel is going to have uh, a big part in maintaining security around the building and into the building, um, as well as they'll be screening people. They'll be training. They'll they, what they usually do is they have a quarterly training for the employees and the staff that will have. Um, uh, active shooter training, active panic button training. So they'll be uh, well, well trained. And if a situation does occur where somebody does come in uh, and, and starts a problem. Okay. Uh, the customers must be 21 plus to enter the facility, uh, the order online or to place a delivery order. IDs will be verified at three points during the purchase, the entry, the point of sale, and the pickup. Uh, there will be strict dispensing protocols in place. There will be customer education. There will be secure on-site product storage policies and a good neighboring policy. Along with that, they will have. Along with that, they'll have a, a security personnel to validate. Anyone, if you do have a drive and pick up. Hey, sorry, guys. Can you just share your screen again? Sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. I can actually take over prevention diversion. Um, okay. I can start on that one. All right. Are we good to go? Yeah, to share the screen. Uh, it won't let us share though. Please hold. Oh, great. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. We're back. We're back. We're back. Jesse, thank you very much for covering security for us. Um, but to touch on prevention um, of diversion, it's very important to us as a company that our products do not wind up in the wrong Nike. hands. Nike. Sorry, Nike, yeah. can you just share it one more time? Oh, okay, yeah. Can you just share the slides one more time? Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no worries. worries. 
All right, you're all set now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, as I was saying, it's very important to us that our products do not wind up in the wrong hands. Um, so, we have implemented a number of policies that will help us prevent diversion um, to the black market and to minors. Um, only individuals 21 years or, or older will be allowed into our building, and we will be checking IDs at three different points upon entry, point of sale, and again at pickup. Um, next up, we will be implementing strict dispensing policies. Individual cu customers will be limited to the quantity of marijuana and marijuana products that they will buy, be able to buy per day in accordance with state and local regulations. Um, we will also implement a minimum purchase amount policy to inhibit people from buying uh, singular items, as I was mentioning, so that will limit the use of public consumption. You know, people will, will be de de, you know, deterred from buying it and going directly outside. Um, we will also be utilizing seed to sale tracking software, which will allow us to track the marijuana through every stage of the grow process. So from germination to final sale and beyond. Um, we also, we want our customers to be educated, engaged, and we want them to feel like they know how to best use our products and get the most out of them. So we will offer monthly marijuana uh, seminars free to the public. Um, we also want to elevate the customer experience and make sure that people feel knowledgeable and confident when they're using our products. Um, next up, we have you know, all marijuana products, um, both marketable and discarded, will be stored separately in a secured lock vault. These areas will be illuminated properly with lighting and will be under 24-hour surveillance. These areas will also be limited access areas, so only certain individuals on our staff will be um, allowed in there. Um, next up, we have the good neighbor policy, which I will actually address further on the last community slide, so I'll save that for then. Um, but lastly, uh, before we sell or otherwise market any marijuana or any marijuana products, our staff will ensure that all products are properly encased in childproof packaging and affixed with the proper warning labels that you can see there on the right. Um, next slide covers employment. So we intend to hire a staff made up of 51% Charlestown residents and 20% City of Boston residents. We plan to hire about 20 to 30 dispensary agents and 5 to 15 uh, delivery agents, totaling 25 to 45 new job opportunities. Um, it's very important to us that our staff is properly trained in every aspect of this operation from customer service to product knowledge and everything in between. So within three months of hiring, all employees will be required to complete the CCC's um, responsible vendor training. Um, and it's also important to us that our staff be primed to do things like recognize signs of impairment, identify fake IDs, de-escalate hostile situations, um, and engage with disabled clients. So we will be making sure that our, our staff has been trained in all of those topics and, and a number more. Um, we also will require that our staff complete an implicit bias training to learn tools to adjust automatic patterns of thinking and ultimately eliminate any discriminatory behavior. Um, you know, we intend to design a brand that embodies diversity and inclusion, which means that all of our staff members um, will be required to behave in a way that aligns with the identity of our company. Um, what else do we have? In there? Education. So we truly believe that education is the key to success in anything in life, which is why we'll ensure that our staff is trained in all areas of business operations, like general security, management, leadership, customer service, pandemic awareness. Um, and I'll move on to the next slide, diversity and inclusion plan. So right now, as it stands, okay. oh, I'll just end the last slide. Last slide. Oh, yeah, so um, as it stands right now, our board is incredibly diverse and that's what we want to expand on when it comes to hiring for retail delivery and security. Um, so far in this process, we've made it a point to hire as many female and um, people of color as possible. We've had a female architect. We've had a female legal advisor and a female financial strategist. Uh, we continue. Um, where we want to continue to empower women and people of color in this industry, as that is exactly what the social equity program was designed to do. Um, this demographic is both demographics are wildly underrepresented in this industry. So we will continue to seek out female minority owned vendors to partner with them as well. As I mentioned, 
Our brand is designed to promote inclusion and to celebrate diversity. We want everybody to feel safe and valued and respected while within our store. Um, we want both our customers and our staff to look around and see people that represent them in a really powerful way. Um, and with that said, I'm going to hand this over to Nikki to talk more about our DNI goals and how we plan to stay accountable to them. So for our hiring goals, we were really specific that that's why the numbers are a little bit random. A lot of people on their slides, I don't know if you've been to other meetings, just say 50% across the board, but we want goals that we can actually attain. So some people say 100% Boston, but Boston's very expensive to live in. So if we want to get people from ADIs, not every street in Boston is an ADI. We were really fortunate to have come from some of these streets that would allow us to apply for social equity. Um, there are areas in Boston that are underserved, but would not qualify. And we want to make sure that we're targeting communities that were hit by the war on drugs the hardest. So that could be people from Quincy, that could be people from, a, there's a whole list on the CCC of, of towns that were affected by the war on drugs. We also wanna do 20% with a quarry, um, helping people re-enter the workforce who are affected by the war on drugs, who had convictions that they shouldn't have, which is why those things are being expunged. We want 51% 50 women and 51% people of color. And in order to do this, we'll partner with local groups that serve these communities. We'll hire through mass hire, and we'll make sure that we advertise this um, via the newspaper, but also by hosting community events and in-house career fairs. Um, we'll be able to track our efforts by seeing how many people show up. What kind of engagement are we getting when we host these? Who's coming out to them? How many people are applying and then getting hired? And also through tracking movement throughout our company. The goal is to have people promoted within, um, and we'll be checking these quarterly and annually to reset our goals as we go. We think that we're also the right fit for this because we'll be able to provide jobs that even we would want. It's really important that we provide living wages, something we're proud of. A lot of people have high level CEOs who don't know how the sausage is made and we want to be there right there with our staff. Um, we're going to be offering benefits like health insurance, living wages, paid time off and 401k and budgeting. And we partnered with um, Adaptive HR to do this. Adaptive is a great partner because they have a lot of experience in terms of compliance. Their PEO model can keep us um, able to keep us free to focus on growing a business. They have thousands of worksite employees around the country, so their group purchasing power will allow us to offer amazing free and low cost benefits to our employees like vision and dental. As far as wages go, we're going to be starting at $16 an hour and offering benefits like Zazoom and FinFit. Zazoom offers um, employees access to their paycheck early. So if you're on a bi-weekly pay cycle and you need money early and you're living paycheck to paycheck, like most people in America, we want you to be able to do that without having to take a loan out, without having to have an awkward conversation. It's money you already earned and we wanna make sure that they have access to it. In addition to that, there's another thing called 98.6 offered through Adaptive and that is telehealth. Right now that's huge. A lot of people aren't able to go in the doctors and we wanna offer that for people at home. Um, 401ks, something that not a lot of people who are working in um, a boutique store are able to, to get. FinFit offers people financial planning, student loan um, services, financial coaching, and budget calculators. These are all things that we want to provide to our employees so they can start building wealth, something that a lot of people affected by the war on drugs were not able to do, and that's why it's important to us, besides just being good bosses. So we have spoken with a number of members of the Lost Village community over the past few months, and it has been made very clear to us that lack of proper lighting and poor security at night are among the biggest concerns. And our, concern, our, our security concerns align with yours because we will be walking these streets with you. Um, it is among our top priority to be a good neighbor to the, to the people in the Lost Village and we wanna contribute as a member of the neighborhood, um, which is why we wanna coordinate uh, with the city and potentially invest in additional lighting and security along Cambridge Street, along Stark Street, Roland Street, Carter Street, and in addition to that, we'd like to try to get some surveillance on Clinton Way, on the Clinton Way staircase and under the 93 overpass. Um, you know, we don't want crowds. We don't want public consumption. We don't want loitering just as badly as you guys don't. Um, and we'll provide, we'll provide a number that um, we'll give out and it will be listed on our website that will give you 24 hour direct access to a represent of our, of our company. Um, another way we, we plan to help out the community is that we're, as I mentioned a few times already, we're going to set a minimum purchase amount so that customers aren't inclined to buy one item and go and use it directly outside. Um, another thing we plan to do is to host monthly events to educate the community on safe consumption practices. So again, they feel um, informed and confident when using our products. We want to be viewed as a responsible and respectful neighbor, and we plan to do our part in mitigating any issues. Um, 
Upon any purchase, we will be requiring customers sign an agreement that states they will not loiter, they will not publicly consume the product, and they will not divert the product. And we have a zero tolerance policy with that. So if we discover though any of that is happening, the individual responsible will be banned indefinitely, and we will notify the law enforcement. Um, next up, the Lost Village Community Trust. So we plan to create the Lost Village Community Trust. Um, you know, we are required to give 3% of our annual net profits back to the city of Boston, um, but that money can be allocated anywhere. It could go to Brighton, East Boston, South Boston, wherever. Um, so what we pledge to do is we wanna, inc we wanna um, include an additional 3% of our annual net profits and put that into the Community Trust. And that would be designed specifically to benefit the Lost Village neighborhood. Um, we've already talked to a few members of the neighborhood and um, our plan is that we would create a board consisting of people from the neighborhood, members of our, um, of our board, and we'd meet throughout the year. And at year's end, we would determine how those funds that we gather could be allocated to better and improve the Lost Village. Um, as we mentioned, our motto at the Heritage Club is where we are from, is where we give back. Um, both Nikki and I come from a real estate background, so we kind of want to leverage our experience in that field and offer home buying and uh, financial planning seminars. Additionally, in 2021, we plan to create the Boston Heritage Fund, which will help people in the community build wealth through real estate investment. And we pledge again to launch a down payment assistance program and to cover the closing costs for 10 qualifying individuals um, and residents each year. One of my favorite parts. All right, so our final slide, delivery. Um, we anticipate that 40% of customers will utilize delivery. In 2018, 13% of customers purchased from a local delivery service. A local delivery service does not mean that it was a legal service. And we think that it's really important that these things are brought to the legal market so they can be um, surveilled properly and done safely. This prevents diversion to minors, which is a big issue. Um, and we think that we'll be able to do it safely. Deliveries are tracked similar to an Uber. They have a manifest, so from the moment it leaves our shop until it gets taken and delivered and signed for by the consumer, it's trapped in the system. At no point is it that it leaves the store and it's just lost. There's a very secure process. Um, the safety precautions that are mandated by the CCC, um, and these regulations are being drafted and voted in, but they seem to stay the same in regards to pre-registration of the customer, ID checks um, at the time of order and when we deliver it to them. And the vehicles have to be outfitted to be secure with the GPS, cameras on site, and then our delivery drivers will also be wearing cams. The social equity program is an exclusive opportunity for us. It's a two-year lockout minimum um, on delivery. So we really wanna thank you guys for coming out. Um, we'll wrap up with a few, a few just notes. A lot of people have compared us to David and Goliath's situation and that we should be really scared, but we're really excited because we know David wins. So we don't want you to give us this opportunity because you know us or you look like us, not just because we're from Boston, not because of all we've been through and all the people who came before us have been through, or because the law mandates racial equity, and it does. We want you to support us because you believe we will do a good job, because of our passion for giving back, and because, it's, and because that's contagious, and because you see that we are thoughtful and most importantly, prepared for what comes next. So thank you guys for your time, your support, and your attendance, and we'll turn it back to Quinlan so you can open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikki, Maggie, and, um, and Jesse as well. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started with the, uh, the Q&A section of tonight's meeting. Um, I just wanna go over a couple more things before we get started. Um, again, the applicant will answer any questions related to their proposal to the best of their ability, and I'll answer any questions specific to the city's process to the best of my ability. Um, if we're unable to answer the question tonight, we'll follow up with you after the meeting to get you that information. Uh, again, we're currently within the open comment period, so that doesn't uh, close or end until the, um, the zoning and cannabis boards happen. Um, and then I'd like to just go over real quick how to raise your hand. So um, if you'd like to speak in order to raise your hand, if you're logged into the WebEx platform or online, you can open the participation tab. It looks like a person with three lines through them and click the hand icon at the bottom left corner to raise your hand if you have a question. Click it again once you have finished with your question or comments to lower your hand. If you are calling in on the phone, simply dial star three to raise your hand and then dial star three again 
to lower your hands. So uh, feel free to uh, raise your hands. Um, you could type questions into the Q and A too, and, and I can uh, and I can read them into the record as well. Um, we did have one in the Q and A. Oh, David and Gwen. Uh, so they already answered that. They just had some questions about uh, deliveries. So thank you for going. Please want to thank the Lucia family on the or congratulate them on their new baby, and thank them for talking to us during this process too. So thank you guys. Absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so we're we're gonna. I have a few hands raised here. So let, let me uh, get to some of them. The first one is at Paige Grig Griglin. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. I'm going to botch a bunch of names tonight. But Paige, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, feel free to ask your question or comment. Hi. Right. Um, I have a question about the hour. So are you, is this, uh, is your application married to the application? Negotiated somehow. Uh, sorry, Paige, can you just repeat that one more time? You're breaking up a little. Yep. I have a question about the hours that you permit that you put forth. Are those hours um, written in stone, or can the hours will the hours be changed? Are they part of your package when you pick up this package for the zoning board or whatever you have to? So will it always be those hours? No. So we have to go in front of the Boston Cannabis Board next, and they will um, look at our application and look at the community feedback to decide if those hours are going to work. Um, we were trying to keep some the community in mind with those hours. One that um, by having our hours be a little bit longer, we'll be on site longer, and that means there'll be more eyes on Cambridge Street. Some of the feedback we've been getting is that that lot's currently vacant. So when we're not there, stuff is going on. By being there longer, nothing is going on, and there's also more surveillance of it. So that's why we tried to maximize that, but also um, by doing the delivery hours separate, um, minimize the traffic um, impact. Thank you. Um, so we're going to go to a call-in user, um, call-in user three. So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. If you are calling in, I just ask that you just state your uh, your first and last name for the record, please. So uh, call-in user three, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, feel free to ask a question or a comment. Hello. Hi, you, we can hear you. Yes, hi. Um, uh, before I start, I'd just like to say, uh, wow, uh, that was an unbelievable uh, presentation. Uh, that was wonderful, girls. Um, again, uh, good evening and thank you, Quinn, for hosting tonight's meeting. Uh, my name is Thomas and I live up on High Street. And I'm calling to throw my support behind the Heritage Club um, for, for many reasons. Uh, the big one is being um, parking. Uh, I like the idea of the parking, and I don't know if I'm allowed to bring up the other location with absolutely no parking. And, um, and if you did want to go to the other location, the only place to park is one of the, P, uh, one of the three, pay, three uh, parking lots you have to pay, which is going to uh, discourage a lot of people from coming. Um, my other one is uh, appointment only. Um, I can see a lot of issues with that one. Uh, number four. Uh, Heritage Club has 3,000 square feet versus 1,000 square feet. That's going to uh, eliminate, uh, eliminate the amount of product, and people will knock them back if they don't have what they want. So I think that's going to hurt them in the long run down there. Um, and the final one, then I'll let you go. Uh, I was reading the Charlestown Bridge today, and I want to make a quote that I, Jack Kelly had. Uh, I think he might have shot himself in the foot with this quote. And... Um, it stinks. We are targeting an audience that's over 40 with lots of disposable income. By this statement alone, he just closed the door on half of Charlestown and probably half of East Somerville. And uh, good luck with that statement, Jack. They may come back and bite you. Thank you. Thank you, Quinn. Yeah, thank you so much. And, you know, I do want to reiterate we are aware that you know, there are two applications right now um, for tonight's meeting. If you could just stick to this current application, um, I know it's hard sometimes um, to, you know, distinguish, especially as they're going on at once. But if, if you could just stick to uh, the current application that we're talking about, that would be great. Um, but thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, guys, do you want to just respond to that, Nikki and um, Maggie? Yeah, of course. With Thomas, was it? Well, thank you very much. We appreciate your support and obviously you're paying attention to what is going on in town and um, hopefully if, if you know business opens up here and things go well, we can um, use you as a sounding board because it's always nice to have um, such involved people in the neighborhood. So thank you very much. 
Thanks. Great. The next raised Sorry. hand is on Frank, Frank Galligan. So, Frank, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Feel free to ask a question or a comment. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for allowing me to ask this question. Uh, first of all, I was very, very impressed with that presentation. Um, as a new resident of Boston within the last two years, I moved up here from Providence, Rhode Island. I'm a former principal of Southie. Uh, currently uh, working to assist my parents uh, with a family member during the COVID pandemic. And I'm, I'm staying in Boston because I believe so, uh, you know, greatly in this city. I am a member of the LGBTQ community, and it's disheartening to me to see the number of businesses that are closing that are LGBTQ run or LGBTQ sponsored or that cater to the LGBTQ community. So it's heartwarming to me to see two individuals who are working to bridge the gap with the community and really help to um, bring, you know, at least at least elevate the community in a way. Um, I was wondering if the mayor's office is aware of the number of LGBTQ businesses that have closed during the pandemic, even before the pandemic, because I certainly noticed a glaring disparity between Boston and Providence. Providence certainly has more from what I've noticed. Um, is the mayor's office doing anything to support LGBTQ run businesses in the area? And um, is the mayor's office aware of how many LGBTQ businesses have closed um, within like the last several years? Yeah, th thanks, Frank. Just to, um, just to answer that, I, I personally don't know, but we do have a, um, an LGBTQ liaison at the mayor's office. And, um, I'm happy to connect you with him at the end of this meeting. Um, if just to follow up, um, you know, feel free to send me an email. I'll give everyone my information too, and uh, we can connect you with him because um, he might be the best person to talk to you about that. Um, as as far as um, the application goes, guys, anything to add there, uh, Nikki and Maggie? We're just excited to bring more diversity to cannabis because right now in that space, they're less than 4% are LGBTQ owned. Um, so we're excited to have all sorts of representation in our business. The only thing we don't really have is veterans and we really appreciate the people who serve. So we'd like to hire them if any of them are interested and we want to be able to bring cannabis to those who need those for whatever purposes. Thank you. And yeah, Frank, if you just want to just follow up with me after, um, you could send me an email or, you know, give me a call tomorrow, whatever's easiest for you. Um, I'm happy to connect you there. So thank you for that. Um, so the next we have a call in user. Um, again, if you're calling in, can you just state your first and last name for the record, please? I'm going to go ahead and unmute call in user six now. Uh, feel free to ask a question or, or submit a comment. Hi, my name is Gretchen Blomendale. Uh, my husband and I own 10-24 uh, Roland Street, uh, which is towards the end of the street. And um, I just want to re reiterate, it was quite an impressive um, presentation and um, you're a very impressive young woman. So we're uh, anxious to meet you. But that being said, we, we do have a, a major concern for us. We're a little bit unique situation in that um, we've had the building for 20 years um, it is a very important building to us and our pretty much our primary building. Um, and we do have uh, a mix of tenants that are in there, some elderly people, uh, some retail that is there on Saturdays. Um, we do have people that are in tech that are there working all different hours of the night, Saturday, Sunday. It's a pretty open, casual building. And our concern is that we are located at the end of the street, kind of a dead end. Um, and we are concerned, even though you did mention some of the uh, um, things that you would do to alleviate the loitering, the problem that I feel is that we're kind of right down the corner so they would walk away and that we would wind up with, a, you know, a, a, a loitering situation that would impact our tenants um, through the course of, you know, Monday through Sunday. And also, we are the only way to get into our building would be to bypass, you know, to go through where you're located. So we really just have that one way in. We don't have the, the enter exit like 52 Roland has on the other side. So I was just wondering if um, you had any ideas that we could work together to try to, you know, alleviate anything like that that might happen, you know, with the traffic. Um, that would inhibit our tenants from, you know, having an ease of coming in and coming out. Thank you so much. Just go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nikki and Maggie, if you want to just respond, go ahead. 
<laughs> Gretchen, thanks for calling in, and we're really excited to be your neighbors. Um, but most importantly, we have thought about those concerns too. Um, we will have security cameras, but this is something we've talked about the same um, with that stairwell. This is, the community has a lot of concerns about loitering, and we want to have someone on staff do an hourly walk of the neighborhood streets, all of them. Um, it's a nice way to get fresh air. It doesn't matter the time of year, um, but uh, that's just another way that we can call in um, local law enforcement because those are the people who will have to come in to take care of that. But that makes sure we have, we have eyes on it and we're taking responsibility for our part and what we're bringing. And in terms of traffic, we're really happy to work with you on whatever plan works. We've actually we had to flyer the area, and so we've walked the streets and talked to a lot of the people, and everyone there is super friendly. Um, so we're really excited to work with you guys on that and make that workable for your tenants as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, and uh, thanks for calling in. And just a reminder, if you do want to state um, your address too, you can put that in. So I know uh, we had a call from Rowan Street. So thanks for uh, doing that for us. Uh, next, we have Mary. So uh, Mary, if you just want to state your last name too, and then um, if you have an address, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you now though. So feel free to ask a question or a comment. Hi, Quinn, it's uh, Mary Locke. <laughs> <laughs> it's um mary boucher and i'm actually calling from 40 roland street um from my place of work um we're actually the big building at 40 roland street and um we haven't been contacted by anything i don't think we're part of your good neighbor program but there's absolutely no parking on Roland Street. So I could get five to 10 53 foot trailers a day coming down either Stock Street if they do it by accident, but mostly Carter Street. Um, there are cars parked on either side of the street where no parking is allowed anyway. Um, it's 10 past seven. I'm in the building alone. So I have to leave here in the dark. Um, I don't want to have to worry about what I'm going out to, or I don't have to worry about my employees either. Many people, uh, even from the building 52 to 56, um, they come in and try to park in our parking lot during the day. You don't have enough parking spaces for 25 to 45 employees. You said you only have 11 parking spaces during the day and only seven are retail. There's no parking on either side of Carter Street, but people do it all the time to run quickly into the store or for tavern at the end of the world. It's an issue down here. I'm also curious to know, um, have you spoken with any other of the businesses down here? Tavern at the end of the world, Blue Labor Liquor Store, certainly not Boston Paperboard. And we've been here for over 70 years and pretty hard to miss. Uh, and and who, who are you paying rent to? Is this still, who still owns that um, building? Uh, so just to address the point you made in regards to parking, so we do have the 11 spots on site. We'll have the additional 12, as I said, in the evenings and on the weekends. But as I mentioned, we currently are negotiating with a landlord who owns an additional lot within walking distance, and that will give us 40 additional parking spots that will be off-site parking specifically for our employees. Um, and if you want to address yeah. the second part. Um, so there's also about four vacant lots on that street that we reached out to to make sure that we have offsite employee, employee parking, but employees will not be permitted. We'll know when they're applying, whether they're applying an in distance to be able to take public transportation or bike. Because if they are from further away, we're trying to hire local. We already said 51% of these people are from Charlestown. Um, so making sure that those people who are going to be driving have a place to park that is not on Cambridge Street. It doesn't matter to us that those aren't residential spots. We don't want our employees using that. We don't want our customers using that. That's why we have the 11 designated spots. So with 15 kiosks, even if every single kiosk was full, we would imagine that if over half of them are driving, there's a spot for them, but that for employees, they would have multiple lots to, play, um, to park in and as well as um, public transportation to take. And then we did send out certified letters that we were um, required to send out by state and local law um, we did send that to Boston Paperboard. I hand addressed it, so I know that it was sent. So I'm really sorry that it didn't get to you. Um, I don't know what's going on with the post office. I don't know if it's ever people are um, <laughs> going through that. Um, and our landlord are the same owners that own, I believe it's 100 Cambridge Street. Do you know the name of the trust? 
I don't off the top of my um, But that is our landlord owns um, our property as well as the parking lot to the right of, of us and the building to the right of that um, off of it's what is that? Roland. Roland on Roland Street. Yeah. So, um, like we said, we want to be a partner to all of our neighbors there. So making sure that we're surveilling so that it is you do feel comfortable when you're leaving at night. We're also going to be there working and late and walking at night. So we want to feel like equally as safe. Um, second to that, um, we don't want anyone parking in your lot. And that's why when people come, we'll be able to see we have security people seeing where people are walking up to. If they're walking from behind the building, the odds are they didn't prop park, prop park properly. And that's something we'll be looking out for. People will either be coming in, walking in off Cambridge Street, or they're going to be walking in from the lot or from the Uber drop off, drop off spot, all of which is surveilled. And the surveillance during the day is 24 hours. So there's someone in that surveillance room watching that footage. Um, so we'll know where they're coming from on the spot. It's not something that will re be reviewed after the fact. And I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you guys. And thank you, Mary. If you do have any follow ups to or any further questions, just keep your hand raised till the end and um, we'll, we'll come back to you. I just want to get through um, some of the people we haven't got to yet. So thank you, Mary. Um, but we're going to go to another call one user. Uh, so call one user 24. I'm going to unmute you. Uh, if you could just state your name and address for the record, please. Hi. Good there? Yep, we can yeah. hear you. Hi, my name is Scott. I'm from Chelsea. I'm a property owner in Chelsea. And after listening to the Heritage Club presentation, what an awesome professional presentation. Um, with that Thank being you. said, um, location is key, absolutely key. And helping out the, the surrounding community as well as the community of Delta, that's a, that's a great honor to have these women, um, you know, stick up with their business to help us because we really need it. And um, I'm just going to end with this, that I support the Heritage Club 100%. Thank you, sir. Thank you, girls. Yep. Thank, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I mean, you guys want to respond to that at all? Yeah, the, the support is huge. We really appreciate you calling in. And again, just paying attention and listening to what, you know, we hope to give back. And I mean, like I said, my whole my whole family is from Charlestown. I, I can't show up to parade day having done bad business in this town. So thank you very much. I appreciate that support. We appreciate that support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next, we have Tracy Ferreter. Uh, Tracy, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, feel free to um, say a question or comment. Uh, you should be unmuted now. Great, thank you. Thanks, everyone, and thanks, Maggie and Nikki, for an awesome presentation. Uh, this is more of just a comment and a show of support. I couldn't be more impressed with the two of you and the dedication and attention to detail that you've shown throughout tonight and throughout the entire process. And just want to say that as a property owner in the city of Boston, you know, these are the people that we need as our future leaders and the people to bring us, you know, you know, strong and, and through the future and, you know, tremendous role models for the women of our community. And I just want to say thank you, Maggie and Nikki, for, for the great presentation tonight. Thank you very much for your support. We appreciate that encouragement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Um, next, we have Brian Callahan. So, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you just your name and um, address for the record. Sorry. Wait, you know, it's Anne Marie. Hey, Anne Marie, how are you? Good, thank you. So, uh, my name is Anne Marie Callahan. I live at 17 Parker Street. And I want to um, applaud you two for. Uh, taking on this endeavor as the mother of four daughters i am thrilled to see a woman minority lgbtq owned group um uh doing this but i am disappointed that none of the owners of board members are actually from Charleston. um i live probably about a tenth of a mile from your new business and one of the things that um uh, I have a couple of comments, and I think that our neighborhood is referred as the Lost Village, which we don't always take kindly to. But um, one of the things that concerns us, obviously, is the traffic that is going on in Brighton and Parker Street. And so when you tell me that the size of your store and the number of employees um, that you presented tonight is that large, 
I'm very concerned about the amount of traffic that will again be coming through our neighborhood when we live. So I, I, I want to say that because we've been trying to work with the city of Boston forever. Um, and, it, and the traffic is just continuing to grow. People are, have found through ways how to get down our streets. They have uh, learned that they can get around Sullivan Square, that they can get to the Green Line, that they can get to Union Square all by going down Park. And now, if we're going to have a business like the voice at the very bottom of our street, with the number of employees and the size of the store, that is only going to make a situation even worse. And so, I, I'll be honest with you. I, I have a couple other points. I'm going to tell you right now that I cannot support this unless our streets become revenue. And. Boston traffic has been here. They have looked at it, but they refuse to acknowledge it. So if if you're looking for support from me and from others in the neighborhood, I would suggest that you look strongly in helping us get resident only access to our streets. That's number one. And number two, uh, today in the bridge. Uh, there was an article from New England Development, and it, they said in the article that as of today, no one attached with New England Development has an ownership interest in this venture. It then went on to say that um, neither of you uh, were able to respond to this comment. So I'd like to give you the opportunity now to respond to the comment. And let us know where New England Development stands with regard to your business and what role Bluminous has with regard to your business. Perfect. Can we take that away? Yeah, thank you so much, Anne Marie. Yeah, if you guys want to respond, uh, you can go ahead. Anne Marie, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for listening and taking the time to attend the meeting. Um, we really want to partner with people who actually live in that area of Charlestown, not just the entire Charlestown. We want to represent all of Charlestown and Boston, but you guys are going to be the most affected by any of this business. So we do want to talk with you and um, we'll reach out after this to continue that conversation. But as far as traffic, we agree that that should be resident parking and we were able to already get 200 letters of support. So we have no problem going and canvassing for signatures to get that resident um, parking for you guys. It's going to have to be the owners that are advocating that from the city and we think we can get enough of you together to do that. I think that's important that those that shows even on Cambridge Street. I noticed right there on the far side of Cambridge Street, the side with the Dunkin Donuts and the Speedway, that's two hour parking. So I imagine a lot of people are there taking the ticket and just they don't care if they get the parking ticket taking the tea. I already can see that that's a problem and I don't know how we get more attention besides working together on this. So I hope we can work on that. And then in addition to that, we do have the offsite parking for employees that we're either going to have to pay for, but we're not going to allow them to affect the community because they're partners with you too. And if they don't understand that they're jeopardizing their own jobs and they're not a good fit to work for us. So it's really important that we respect you guys in that way with parking and that um, even if it's making some of those streets one ways, whatever the community wants, um, so that traffic isn't coming down there during specific hours, like maybe there are no turns under those streets. There's a lot of ways to make that work and that should have been done even before we got here, but we're happy to be a part of that change. Um, secondly, as far as uh, the Patriot article, so we responded, but we didn't respond in time before it could get out to editing, but Maggie and I own 100% of our business. We are not affiliated with Luminous and it's been the hardest thing for us because a lot of that we've had to do a lot of work to explain that we're absolutely not a part of that. Um, we've started this on our own. Everything we've done has been on our own and it's already a hard industry to get into besides cleaning up other people's mistakes. Um, they came in here and it didn't seem like they really wanted to be here for you. We're from disadvantaged backgrounds uh, across the board. So it's really important that we make sure that nobody else feels the way we have felt. Um, and that is not what happened when they came in. We don't know of any developments going on. Our landlords are not selling our building. We have no, like, and they're not selling their building either. They're actually looking for tenants for that building. So we know they're not going anywhere. And that's why we wanted to choose this location. We're investing a lot of money into this. So if we're going to invest this much and then it's going to be taken from under us, we're going to be equally as upset. Um, so if that's the case, it's, it's going to be a big problem. Um, as far as the actual ownership, we do not have any investors from New England Development. 
It's just the two of us. We've been bootstrapping this with our own savings and we are looking for funds. We're in talks with four to five investors who are interested and we're trying to find the right partner. There's a lot of vulture investors in this industry that will just try to take half your business and, and may not even give you anything in return, but we're being really thoughtful about who we choose to do this with because this is more than just a one year thing where we're going to sell out. We're going to be in this for at least five years. Um, so we want to make sure that we choose someone who has the same vision to give back like we do. Um, and that won't force us just because we borrowed some money from them. So I hope that really answers your questions. And um, if we can give you our contact info, um, we'll type our email in or it's, is there a way for us to share our contact info Quinlan with everybody who's on the call? I don't know if there's an easy way to do that, but we know where to find you. 17, is it 17 Parker? Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully that's okay if we reach out. Yeah, and you can, uh, if you want to put your contact info in the chat, feel free to, um, I'm going to put mine in there as well. But um, yeah, you can feel free to put it in the chat and we can always follow up and, and connect people after the meeting as well. Thank you. Yep. So we're uh, next is uh, Nate, Nazy K. I want to say it's Nazy K, but I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, if you don't mind just uh, your name and uh, your address, please. Hi, uh, my name is Nazi. I'm a lifelong Bostonian. And first and foremost, I just want to thank Maggie and Nikki. I'm so impressed with your, your presentation today. But um, as a lifelong Bostonian and Black woman, I'm really warm to see such a comprehensive and well thought out plan for this minority owned business. I can't tell you how special and important um, it is to see. The demographic that we actually are that boston actually is reflected in the business ownership. i think it's so 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 important um so i'm really hoping to understand how crucial it is to support the business. um because like i said it's extremely important i also just really quickly want to address the last caller and um the conversation about parking i mean it's very clear that you guys have done a lot of work um to make parking is addressed. And as somebody who's lived in different parts of the city, I grew up in Dorchester, now live in Charlestown, I've been in for a while. I understand that concern of watching your neighborhood change and uh, fighting basically for parking spots. And I I actually was super impressed with that. I was one of the first things you guys addressed. So I just wanted to say thank you. We'll be following and watching you guys and I can't wait to see your business open. Nazi, thank you. Nazi, thank you very much for um, for your comment. We appreciate that very much. Yes, we're hoping to be good neighbors. Thank you, Nazi. Sorry, I did not pronounce your name right. Uh, we got a couple more here. Uh, Robin Reed, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, just your name and your address for the record, please. Hi, I'm Robin Reed. I'm an internist and I live in Dorchester. I'm an advisor for the Heritage Club, and I just wanted to speak to the concerns about loitering and crime. And um, it's it's absolutely reasonable to be concerned about that, given the nature of the products that's being sold. But there, even though there are a few studies, the studies that have been done actually show that neighborhood crime tends to go down when a dispensary is located in a neighborhood. Um, that was published in September of 2019 in a Regional Science and Urban, Urban Economics. And then a second study, um, March 2018, in preventive medicine found that the problems of uh, civic disturbance was more common around liquor stores and tobacco stores than around dispensaries. And that article recommended that we should be requiring more security similar to what's around dispensaries around these other establishments. So hopefully the presence of the dispensary will increase the security and safety on Roland Street. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much. For uh, next, we have uh, Debbie. So, Debbie, uh, I'm going to unmute you. Feel free to just state your first and last name uh, and your address for the record, please. Hi, you guys. Um, my name is Debbie Uccello, and I live on Brighton Street, and I am a neighbor. And I also have the concerns um, of the traffic and everything around this neighborhood because it, it is terrible around here, but also 
I don't, I can't support you guys. And I know you did a great job at, um, you know, um, of letting us know everything. And, and I think it's awesome, but we have one like up the street already in East Somerville, a place. And I just don't know why we have to have one here. I know it's, it's a different, you know, we're in Boston there in Somerville, but it's always that, and I don't know where the rest of our neighbors are tonight, but it's everything always ends up down this end of the town and nothing ever happens good for us, like Anne Marie was saying. So I agree with Anne Marie with a, a lot of things that she had said tonight. And um, I do think you did a great presentation, honestly, um, for, you know, for what you're, what you guys want to do. But that's, that being said, I just, I just can't support it. You know, and I have a son who's around, he's like 14 and he walks around with my, you know, my sister's dog and stuff. And he's down in that area. And I know you said you, you're going to have all kinds of security and everything, but I just don't think I want it for the neighborhood. You know, I'm just, I'm just concerned for our neighborhood, you know, and that's, I guess that's all I have to say, but, you know. Debbie, can I um, answer that now, Quinlan? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much, Debbie, for calling too. Uh, yeah, if you want to respond, go for it. Yeah, so, Debbie, when we first came to look at 116 Cambridge and someone told me it was called the Lost Village, I was so embarrassed and I feel like really disappointed in the fact that you guys haven't felt um, that Boston has considered you in their decisions. I have so much Boston pride and that's why I've been able to get so much support as my friends know how much the city means to me. So that's why we're taking it very seriously that we help um, that community specifically, and not just Charlestown as a whole, a lot of people are coming into cannabis being like, let's do a can drive. Let's um, donate to the sports league and that's it. That's not what we're here to do. We're not throwing money at you. We really want to be partners with you guys. Um, and we hope that we can show that in everything that we do. Um, but the other thing I'll add about the Somerville um, location is that that's medical. They're not recreational. And I don't know how long it will be, at least probably two years due to Somerville and Cambridge doing kind of a equity lockout, similar to Boston's one-to-one -one ratio. Um, but yeah, we're adult use, um, so that means that this gives access to people who can't get their medical card or do not want to get their medical card so that they can um, have access to cannabis um, since it's been legalized. So we think it's really important, but we want to make sure we do a good job and we're really glad you came out. It's kind of hard in COVID that we can't go door to door and knock on doors and introduce ourselves, which we normally would. Um, so we'll take down your information and we'd love if you'd be a part of the process with us and part of that board that we're trying to create for the Lost Village in particular. So thank you for calling. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, we I think we have two more hands raised that haven't uh, spoken yet, and then we'll get back to um, everyone else. So Heather Hollis, uh, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you just your name and your address for the record, and then uh, any questions and comments you have, go for it. Hi everyone, thank you so much, um, Nikki and Maggie. Thank you for the presentation. This was very enlightening. Um, I'm a lifelong Massachusetts resident. I've lived in Boston about eight years and worked in Charlestown in Sullivan Square, actually worked in the Shroff Center. So I'm very familiar with the area. And I think there were so many um, exciting points that you raised during your presentation today. But I think overall, what I'd like to call out is it was just a really thoughtful um, presentation of your business um, from the parking to the lighting on the street. Um, to the DEI initiatives in healthcare. I think that, you know, right now, um, this is a big change for the town. And um, most likely over the next coming years, there is going to be a dispensary here. So I think for the residents of Charlestown, they have an opportunity to choose their neighbors and choose who that, you know, business is. So it's really exciting to see, you know, so much passion and I think thoughtfulness behind not just the business itself, but behind the community engagement. So thank you both. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Heather. So next we have uh, Kim Kyle. Uh, I think it's Kim Kyle anyway, but uh, Kim, Kim, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Uh, go ahead. Okay. Hi, um, I'm actually a resident of Parker Street, so I'm very close to 116 Cambridge. Um, and I definitely agree with um, Debbie and Marianne, uh, Marianne about supporting this. We, um, Brian's been fighting forever for uh, just to get everything that we need around here. My son was almost run over one day, come back from the bus stop. No dramatics, really true. Because the traffic, they just cut through. They whip through all times of the morning. 
and there's so much going on down here. Everything gets thrown at Sullivan Square. And I don't know if, if how you would do something that the other people couldn't do when, you know, the casino, the traffic, it's just, it takes 20 minutes to get to like Whole Foods from here, literally on a summer day, because you can't even take that left off to Cambridge. So um, definitely not in support of this at all. Can I answer, Quinlan? Thanks, Kim. Yeah, um, Thanks, Kim. If, if you guys want to respond, go for it. Kim, yeah, thank you for calling in and we wrote down your information and we also love to stay in touch, but I'd like to say the reason why we can get done why nobody else has gotten it done is the same reason why we're here today. So many people from our backgrounds haven't made it this far in the process. And so if that shows you anything, if we put our minds to it, we're going to get it done. Um, we're not quitters. We're hardworking. We know how to get in touch with people. We know how to get press where it's needed. And it sounds like your village, Lost Village, needs the press to have the rest of Boston understand that you're a part of our Boston family too. Um, and I know that we can do it. I'm not even saying that it's it's a promise I can make. Um, this is not just a political move. This is serious for us because we're going to be your partners. And we want you guys to know that it's what's important to you is important to us and has to be important to us. And anyone who's telling you it's not or that they don't have it in the budget doesn't care. And we know that we can make that happen. And it's very important to us that the neighborhood that we're working in, the neighbors don't feel disenfranchised as it's very clear that the neighbors of the Lost Village do, which is why um, you know, we do intend to create that community trust and we will be offering an additional um, you know, 3% into that every year to make sure that you guys get the initiatives taken care of that you want. Um, you know, we're meeting people in this process. We've clearly, um, you know, I, I'm blown away by the support that, that we've had from family and friends. And, you know, I think as we grow our network in this industry, it'll just make it that much easy, easier for us and for the neighborhood to get things done. And, you know, we want to be an advocate and we want to be a support system. And like I said, top of our priority list is to be a good neighbor to you guys. And we will do whatever it takes to, you know, not be a burden on you guys and to, and to help you get what you want. And to add to that, just really quickly, we have to say thank you to Quinlan for giving us a forum to talk about this because this is he's a great resource for people to say what needs to get done. So we can work with him and we can work with you guys to work with him to make this happen. There are systems in place, but sometimes you don't know about them. I've been a lifelong resident of Boston and I didn't know that there's a neighborhood liaison. So I hope if you didn't know before, you know now Quinlan's <laughs> there for you. We're there for you and and we can make this happen whether we get this or not. So I think it's important. Thanks, and uh, thank you guys as well. Um, I know uh, I, I just said I was going to go back, but I know David and Gwen were trying to um, to get on. Um, I think they had something in the chat, but they just wanted to hop on. So, uh, David and Gwen, I'm going to go to you, and then I'm going to go back to um, to Mar Mary Boucher and Brian Callahan, who, um, who wanted to follow up as well. Uh, so, David, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Feel free to ask a question or comment. Uh, thanks, Quinlan. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, Nikki and Maggie, thank you so much. Um, uh, just to echo the other um, you know, other callers on what a professional presentation. Um, I, I have actually two questions. Um, actually, the first is, I don't know if Robin, you're still on the phone, but I have a specific question for you. Uh, I'm also an internist. I, I practice at MGH, and I'm curious if you could forward the studies to Maggie and Nikki. I'd love to see them. Um, I'm not super familiar on the literature on criminogenic activity from marijuana dispensaries, um, but I do know that some of the literature points to the opposite effect that you've seen. So I'd be curious, uh, actually, the opposite effect that you described on the phone. So I would like to see those studies. Um, for for Nikki, you and Maggie, um, sorry, also, I live at Clinton Place um, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Charlestown. I forgot to mention my address. Um, I just was wondering if you guys could talk a little bit more about the volume projections. Your numbers were about 500 customers per day. Um, I was trying to, uh, we were wrangling the kids, so I might have missed uh, all the numbers, but it looked like about a 13 and a half hour work day, which equates to a little more than one customer every two minutes or so. Um, I was hoping if you had more information about your volume projections, um, particularly like, does that include delivery? Um, have you been able to model that those volume numbers throughout the day to get a sense of when surges in volume might be? How much of that is vehicular traffic versus foot traffic? Um, as you've heard, traffic is such an incredible concern for our community. Um, and the number 500 really stuck out to me, and I just wanted to know more information around that number. Yeah, definitely. So we got our numbers from some of the in the cannabis space, but right now, um, we got it from an article published by Pure, about Pure Oasis. 
what they were projecting was a thousand customers. What they ended up seeing was 600. And what they're seeing right now in COVID is about 300. And we're about the same exact size as them. So we're, we're estimating that that's what we'll have. But given that there's going to be more dispensaries open by the time we're open, we don't think we're going to see that full 600. So that's where we got the 500 number from. And as far as um, the hours and how that changes, there are going to be some hours and mainly that would have been during rush hour, which is why we have the delivery vehicles by having those two to five vehicles that will have delivery. We'll be able to um, take about 40 to 100 customers off of our, our daily route that would be coming here and we'll be able to scale that as we go to be able to do more and more of that. But during the hours like lunchtime, we expect a little bit more high volume and also the hours from about like five to seven. Um, we think that's that's going to be a little bit more of a peak time and. We'll be able to handle that traffic specifically because we're going to have pre registration, something I mentioned. So when people are coming, they don't want to wait in line. They're not coming and driving just because it's convenient to sit in the car. It's not something that Netta or any of the other people are offering, but we want to give people an idea of their wait time. This isn't Comcast. We're not giving you a four hour window of when to come by. We want it to be specific and we want to be reliable in that way. That way we can mitigate traffic and control it and help the neighbors. Like you said, it's, it's already a busy street and it needs to be controlled well. Can send you those studies. One of them was published in the globe. The other one I'm going to have to ask her for, but I will get those over to you. Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, the literature is pretty deep on this space, so um, I love to see what she's referencing. Get that too. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, Dave and, and that one. Um, I know Mayor. I think Mary just lowered her hand, but um, we're, we're going to go to Brian uh, Callahan again, and then I had two uh, more people raise their hand after that. Peter and Paige just. Uh, Hang tight, but um, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Feel free to um, ask another question or comment. Hi, Quinn. It's Anne Marie, and, and thank you for allowing me to circle back. I, I wanted to clarify with Nikki that um, we're not looking for resident parking. We already have it. We're looking for resident-only access up Brighton, across Perkins, down Parker, and the uh, the other streets, Clinton and Hadley Place. And so we had BTD come out a couple years ago to do a, a study to see whether or not that was warranted in their eyes. And in the, I think it, I believe it was from 9 a.m. to 12 noon, we had 1,100 cars go down our street. And yet BTD didn't think that warranted us to have resident access only. And I, I will tell you that I, I'm, I'm, very, um, I'm, I like what you presented tonight and I think you've done a very good job, but I, we are the only people who will be impacted the way nobody else will be. So I really would appreciate it if you would think long and hard about that particular issue. It's a, it's an enormous issue. It has been enormous before you put your business down there. And, um, and Tim's son is a good example of living with. So if you look for support from Lost Village, I don't think you're going to get it until you get some assurances from the city that we will have resident access only and that it is enforced. Because otherwise, everybody puts on their ways and they can just zoom down up streets and cut through. So that, that I, I wanted to clarify that with you. We, we're not looking about the parking, we're really looking for the cut -throughs. Um, And that if there's something else in the neighborhood that people are cutting to get to, that's just only going to exacerbate what we have already. That's good. Can we comment back again? So, yeah, th thank you so much, Anne Marie. Um, yeah, if you want to just go ahead uh, and respond, Nikki and Maggie. Yep, so similarly, we appreciate that you were very clear with us on what you're looking for. Um, that's still something we can advocate for. It's not different than the, the sheet permit process. It's not something that happens as often, so it is a little bit harder to advocate for, but it's not going to stop us from working on that. Um, and that's something that when we go in front of the BCD, we can bring up that this is something they need to be looking at in every community they're putting cannabis in. It's not just specific to you guys. Anywhere they're putting this, they're bringing more traffic and they need to be conscientious. We're going to be doing our own traffic impact study. Um, just to be able to show the exact numbers. So we'll be able to use that same study um, and show them what our impact will be and why we think it's important that this go in alongside our construction plan. So we're going to be in front of the zoning board. We're going to be in front of the city and we'll have their ear. So while we have it, we can take advantage of that to advocate for you guys and make sure that you guys get that no access 
Um, and not just during those hours of 9 to 12, that could just be for residents only. There's a bunch of streets like that in Boston already. Yep, and traffic issues can be coordinated with Boston Transportation Department. And what we will do is we can work directly with Quinlan to figure out the, a way to help. Um, you know, it's disappointing that it sounds like this is a longstanding issue with you guys that you've been advocating for for a while with really no results. Um, but that's something that we can help with. And we'd like to. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so next we have Peter Ivanov. Um, Peter, I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, just uh, your name and address for the record, and then um, your question and comments. Thanks, Quinn. Uh, my name is Peter, and I live right across the street from uh, the post business, uh, 32 Parker. Uh, thanks very much, uh, everyone, for the presentation. Uh, I think it was great, and I'm glad actually that uh, women are taking taking advantage of opportunities, and this is the way to go. Um, I have two concerns, and I think I'm expressing the same concerns of, as everybody else here. As a resident on the Parker Street, it's been uh, it's been going like crazy lately uh, in terms of traffic, um, and I think the, the the proposed business will increase that traffic. Uh, the hours of operations uh, that I've heard between 8 a.m. in the morning and, and 9 p.m. In, in the evening. Um, I think that the biggest the biggest issue with the hours is going to be between the hours of 5 and 8, 8 p.m. Uh, just because it, that, that's the time where everybody is traveling. It literally takes 20 minutes to go through uh, under the bridge, um, under the overpass actually of 90 from uh, Cambridge Street all the way down to the Rotary. This is, this is ridiculous. And I think uh, the traffic will, uh, that establishment will increase that. Second thought is regarding security and um, issues with crimes. Lately, we have seen uh, increased uh, crimes actually on our street specifically, like uh, packages being stolen. We actually installed camera on our building just because of the same reasons. Uh, and right across the street also is Dunkin' Donuts with a huge parking lot, which is not, uh, doesn't have a light uh, for the most part. We are uh, concerned about crime being done on the parking lot. We actually have seen and heard people screaming and yelling in the parking lot. And this is a big concern for us. So, um, again, those are the two concerns that I have. Uh, I would like to hear the comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Yeah, if you guys want to respond. So the concerns that you address align entirely with the concerns that we have. Obviously, we want to operate in a safe area um, because, you know, we'll be doing business there. We don't want customers to not want to come to us because they think our area is dangerous or unsafe or anything like that. Um, but in regards to lighting and security, what, one of our biggest expenses will be our security system. We will have commercial grade cameras. We will have lighting that will illuminate the whole area so that we can you know, account for adequate surveillance. Um, you know, we will have security on staff that will, like we said, you know, be monitoring the neighborhood, be walking around every so often just to check things out. Um, but like, you know, our concerns are the same as yours in that department. And I think that the security system that we'll put in place, which will be 24 hours, will really help deter um, any issues, you know, especially in the few hours that we're not gonna be there. Like we said, you know, we'll end operations at nine, but one of us, if not both of us, will be there till 10 o'clock and beyond shutting the place down. While we're there, you know, everything, lights will be on. We think that that's gonna deter people from doing anything illegal or anything wrong um, back there. But we appreciate, uh, you know, your concerns. Again, we wanna take down your information. You know, we want active and involved members of the community um, to voice their concerns so that we can work with them to make sure, like I said, um, you know, we are good neighbors. And to add to that, um, and we did write down that you have 32 Parker, um, and we'll reach out. But we did reach out to the um, owner of the lot at 20 Perkins, and we asked him if we would be able to rent that and put the lighting in because we drove over there just to see it. It would be a great lot for the offsite parking that we're talking about. We've been looking at two other lots, but this is an additional opportunity, and it's an opportunity to add lighting where somebody else should have done it. Right now, we're playing a lot of cleanup games. We're cleaning up for things that didn't get hap that didn't happen because there wasn't an no one was listening. So it's really good that we're here to listen, whether we get this or not. But I think that that lighting is important and that stairwell. We've heard a lot about those complaints and, and the things and what you're seeing is scary. We don't think anybody should have to see that in their backyard or in general. Um, so we want to be a part of making sure that gets surveilled properly. And whether that's cameras we're allowed to put in, whether it's lights that we're allowed to put in or the city has to put in, they need to be put in regardless. Um, the opioid 
epidemic is a big issue and we know that people are doing these things in these dark alleyways, it's cannabis aside, so we, it needs to be addressed at the end of the day. And as far as the hours from 5 to 8 p.m., we do know that those are going to be higher hours. That's when people aren't working. That's when they're able to get to the store. And if we're able, as soon as delivery comes out, we'll one, be able to have less traffic than any other dispensary. All the other dispensaries aren't social equity owned. There's very few social equity owned. So they'll only be able to have delivery if they partner with one. But we have that in-house and we can prioritize delivering for our customers and making that a better way for them to get product so that they're not coming into the store during those hours and even discounting and giving no delivery fee during those hours. The other thing that we were thinking about um, is besides the pre-registration is having a set, a set of kiosks that are appointment only. So people who don't want to wait, they've shown you pictures of the lines at Netta. We don't think that anybody should have to wait for two hours to get this. Um, and we don't want to have an experience like that. It's not a good customer experience and, and we're trying to create something that's different. So that's a priority for us as well and something that we're going to work on to help us and protect you as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we do have two more uh, people who raised their hands. Um, so we'll get to Paige and Denise. Um, I, I will say it's almost eight o'clock at this point. So um, if we don't get to your questions or comments tonight, just feel free to email or uh, call me. Um, I'm going to say that in the recording and then I'll put it in the chat. Um, so my email is Quinlan, Q U I N L A N dot lock. L O C K E at boston.gov. Phone number is 617-635-3549. And while I put that in the chat, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute Paige, uh, Griglin Paige, if you could just state your name and address for the record and then um, ask your question or comment. Hi, Paige. I live at 37 Park Street. I forgot to mention my address before. Um, and Nikki and Maggie, I really, I love your plan to embody diversity and inclusion. It makes me so happy. I'd love to have this business in my neighborhood, but I have to echo everybody else on Parker Street and Brighton Street about the, the cut through problem and the traffic and the noise and the large trucks and all the traffic begins at like 4.15 in the morning. Um, on street and thinking and it kind of slows down maybe around five and which is great but thinking that it's not going to slow down and there'll be more traffic it doesn't it doesn't make me happy doesn't well with me um so i'm really on the fence i just i'd love a business like yours here um the social equity is great but the the, the traffic part the noise um the high volume and what goes on at speedway i don't know Yep, no, we really understand. And um, it was okay if I just go ahead and answer, Quinn. Y yep, go for it. Um, we really understand. And Paige, I wrote down your address so we can reach out to you. And then if, if through you guys we're able to speak to more people in the neighborhood, we'd love to get in touch with people. It's really hard to not be able to knock on doors as much as we would have liked to, but just to get your feedback on literally everything we're working on. Um, it's it's hard to do this if we don't have your guys' support and to do it well and to make it last and be successful. So we want to work closely with you guys on this, not just the fund. That's just something that we want to do to give back, but to, to build it correctly. We want to get in touch with you guys before we get there. Um, we can't help other people's traffic, but what we can do is do the best part with our own and to make a plan that won't have the least impact. There are plenty of other businesses that have impacted as well. and and. Unfortunately, they didn't take the time to really think about it, but we're trying to do our best to make sure that we do. And we hope that you guys see that and appreciate that. And we love that you love the diversity. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> do you have anything to add on that? No, no, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank and uh, the, last, the last one we have here is Denise Brown. Um, Denise, I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you. Feel free to just um, state your name and address and then any questions or comments you have. Hey, Denise, you should be unmuted. Denise, are you there? It's Mercury retrograde. <laughs> okay. Um, so, might be some technical difficulties, but um, oh, it's it looks like David and Gwen. Um, might be able to speak for Denise. Uh, D David, are you there? Uh, I'm here. I, I I don't know what Didi was going to say, but um, considering she's my neighbor, 
Uh, I was just going to say, Quinlan, and this is more for you in the mayor's office. Um, you know, this is the second business that's been proposed to go here and in this location. And I think, you know, everyone on this call who attended the, the previous proposal will, will, will probably think the same way as I, that this is a much better business proposal than the previous one. That said, what has been made very clear is that traffic is a considerable issue. And it's not Nikki and Maggie's fault or responsibility to fix it. But I feel like our community as a whole is, is you know, we're, we're in opposition or people are in opposition of what could otherwise be a fantastic business with, you know, two fantastic owners um, because of a city problem. And so I just wanted to, to highlight that, right? This is like, if, if the community ultimately doesn't support this business, it's not because of these two women, it's because of the, the issues of traffic in and around our area. So I just wanted to sort of lay that, if, if, if that could go anywhere else. Yeah, I completely understand. I mean, this is something that, um, you know, has been brought to my attention since I started, um, just to address it real quick. I mean, I've worked with a lot of people um, from that area in that community. I know we worked to get BTD down there to try to address some of these situations. Um, we, you know, tried to get creative with some different ways to reduce traffic. Um, Obviously, it's still an issue, and it's definitely something that I'll be, um, you know, bringing up with BTD again to see if they can maybe take another look. Um, I'm sure Nikki and Maggie uh, will be very helpful advocating for you guys as well. Um, so uh, it's definitely something, you know, I'm I'm always bringing it up when it comes to traffic that the area around Sullivan Square is the worst. I live in Charlestown too. I see it every single day. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely something that I continue to bring up and I continue to advocate for. Um, and I'm you know glad we have people from the area to to do that with me and to advocate with me. So um, trust me, I'm on your side. I'm still advocating, and um, you know hopefully um, we can, we can work on a on a solution for for the traffic down there. You know. Um, yeah. So so with that, I mean, uh, do you guys have any final words, Nikki and Maggie? Lisa, I want to say thank you to all of you guys. There are over 80 of you on the call, so we really appreciate you guys coming out and listening. I know it ran over, so we're glad to get to hear from you guys. And we do want to be partners, so did you put our contact info in the chat? Uh, yeah, I sent it to Quinlan. 617heritage at gmail.com. And then my cell phone is, uh, I'll just, if you email me, I can just give it back to you, but you can Google me, Nikki John, spelled like Nike, and it should come up. I'm in real estate. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Awesome. Thank you guys very yep. much. And thank you, Quinlan, for organizing this. And MC yeah, thank you guys so much, and um, I'm happy to connect anybody here, the applicants, to uh, anybody that reaches out. So feel free to reach out to me if you need anything. And um, thank you so much for taking time out of tonight. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, guys.